Professor Anke. Good morning. Thank you for giving us an interview about uh, iron deficiency and anemia. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. So my first question, how common is iron deficiency in heart failure? Well, we are investigating iron deficiency now for about 10 years and we have found it to be extremely frequent, much more than we previously expected. Approximately 60% of patients with anemia and heart failure and approximately 40% of patients with heart failure without anemia do have iron deficiency. How common is anemia and is this always related to iron deficiency? Anemia is less common than iron deficiency. About 10-12% of patients with heart failure uh, do have anemia. In the hospital it may be more up to 15 or 20% because there the patients are on average more severe. Uh, less common in mild heart failure patients there maybe only 5 or 8% of patients have anemia. Now, I would say that about 60 to 70% of all patients with anemia do have a strong association with iron deficiency. What clinical consequences occur due to iron deficiency and why? Iron deficiency has several metabolic, several important clinical consequences that relate to its ability to bind oxygen and the need of the body for iron to, for production of red cells. So iron deficiency being associated with anemia can contribute to less oxygen transport in tissues and thereby contribute to shortness of breath and poor exercise capacity. But also iron deficiency is related uh, to inability of muscle to really perform well and possibly then we also see some cardiac dysfunction but more research is needed in this field. Can you elaborate the relationship between iron deficiency, exercise capacity and performance and increased mortality risk? Yes, what we are seeing basically is that both anemia and iron deficiency are related to poor prognosis and patients. If you have anemia, you have already a prognosis that is impaired to patients that are stable, have no anemia, have no iron deficiency. If you have only iron deficiency but no anemia, your prognosis is worse than those who have only anemia. But if you have both together, then you have really the worst prognosis. We don't fully understand the reason for the poor prognosis, but maybe there's also simply a strong association of which iron deficiency anemia are signs of, which is that more severely, generally more severely ill patients just show these pathophysiological abnormalities and then have poorer outcomes. Iron deficiency per se might be prognostically more ominous than anemia in coronary heart failure. Why? As I just said, basically, uh, we understand that anemia is associated with poor prognosis, but iron deficiency is even more so associated. Well, the reason is that iron deficiency is not only linked to poor oxygen transport, but also to poor oxygen utilization. And oxygen utilization being linked to iron deficiency is needed in every single organ of the body. You need it in the kidney, you need it in the brain, you need it in the heart, you need it in the skeletal muscle. And that is a much more ubiquitous kind of problem than just having not enough blood cells like an anemia. How do you diagnose iron deficiency? Yes, this is important because many people only consider iron deficiency when there is absolute iron deficiency. We diagnose iron deficiency in a more global way uh, by investigating uh, the functional iron deficiency. We s declare a patient to have in heart failure iron deficiency when ferritin levels are less than 100 or when ferritin levels are between 100 and 300 plus having a transferrin saturation of less than 20 percent. So uh, absolute versus functional iron deficiency is a difference. Yes, there is a difference. In absolute iron deficiency, you only have uh, a very small iron store overall in the body and the ferritin levels are even less than 30. Now, in functional iron deficiency, in principle, there isn't maybe enough iron in the body, 
but because of inflammatory processes it's in the wrong place. It's bound in macrophages, it's bound in cells of the gut, it's not available for the many different tissues that need the iron to use it as a catalyst for the respiratory chain reactions. The iron is in the wrong place and that is the key feature of functional iron deficiency. Given these iron deficiencies, what therapies are there? Well, there is different types of iron therapies, all in intravenous iron. Our best experience is with intravenous iron in heart failure and we are using uh, iron sucrose or iron carboximaltose uh, for the treatment of heart failure patients. Does oral iron work? Oral iron can work if the patient is compliant. Unfortunately, 50% of patients receiving oral iron are not really compliant. And if you have a lot of time. Uptake of oral iron takes a long time. You need about four, six or eight months, depending on the degree of iron deficiency, to have an adequate iron intake overall to replenish the stores with iron. And so if you have enough time and if you have a really compliant patient that is not bothered about the side effects, which are mainly related to gastrointestinal problems and to the bitter taste uh, of the oral iron, if you have such a patient, it may work, but it really takes a lot of time. How long does IV iron take to show improvements? In the studies we have done, the improvements were already seen after four weeks. Now, can it be faster than four weeks? I believe yes. Some patient reports, when you speak to them, report improvements within a few days, maybe a week. We just, in our trials, didn't expect such a fast improvement, so we didn't have proper assessments already after one or two weeks. Uh, iron deficiency treatment with intravenous iron because you have 100% compliance and really give a fairly large dose of iron immediately and don't have any absorption problems can work very fast and, and that's really an advantage. How much iron is needed and what would you recommend? The typical dose you need can be calculated using the Ganzoni formula depending on the body weight, depending on the hemoglobin of the patient or you can use a more modern, simpler approach where you basically say, okay, every patient with chronic heart failure should receive between 1,000 and 2,000 milligram. And you typically give this in 500 milligram doses of intravenous iron, so it's fairly fast. Within a week, you can have already 1,000 milligram by giving one week apart 500 milligram doses in short infusions. You then basically say, okay, this is the standard dose, 1,000 milligram. But if the patient is having a body weight above 70 kilogram, you give an extra 500 milligram. And if the patient has a hemoglobin value of less than 10, which is rare in heart failure, but it may occur, then you give another 500 milligram extra. So 1,000, 1,500 or 2,000 milligram as the starting uh, in 500 milligram doses, in my opinion. And then every three or four months, you give an additional 500 milligram. That should do it. Uh, after half a year, you might stop and just observe the patient whether you've solved the problem. If you haven't solved it, maybe after another half a year, you need to restart therapy. Now, erythropoiesis stimulating agent therapy can cause iron deficiency. What should be done to counterbalance this effect? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, ESAs, erythropoiesis stimulating agents, all have in common that they of course improve the body's ability to produce red blood cells. For that they need iron and that's why iron deficiency can result from the use of ESAs. The easiest thing is simply to accompany therapy of ESAs with the use of intravenous iron. If you do this you might even reduce the dose of uh, ESAs that you need and therefore uh, it may then also be a little bit more cost effective. What is the impact of IV ferric carboximaltose on different organ functions? Well, this is an interesting and really uh, improving area of research that we are doing. Not only do we improve the symptoms, exercise capacity, quality of life of patients, but we seem to also have organ dysfunction impact. Our newest research has shown that we positively uh, improve the kidney function of patients. Also, kidney function is an energy-intensive process and thereby 
uh, we think by giving iron we improve the energetics of the kidney and the kidney function and improve kidney function. Skeletal muscle can be improved and possibly also the heart but in these areas we have some more research to do. Are there side effects with using ferric carboxymaltose? There is one side effect that uh, is less common than with oral iron but still more common than with placebo that is of note which is gastrointestinal problems. If you treat a patient with intravenous iron you should be aware that about 15 to 20 percent of patients may experience gastrointestinal problems. In our placebo group it was about 7 percent. In the all iron groups it's about 30 to 40 percent. So yes there are some gastrointestinal problems but they are counterbalanced by overall uh, better symptoms, better quality of life. We also have uh, overall the suggestion of cost effectiveness of this therapy so maybe this can be acceptable for patients. We are coming to the last question. Is there a take-home message of our interview? My take-home message is think about iron deficiency when you see a patient with symptoms. Patients with symptoms don't need to have symptoms. We can do something about it and intravenous iron therapy is now in the European guidelines for the treatment uh, of acute heart failure and the diagnosis of iron deficiency is part of the diagnostic session in these guidelines. Thinking about iron deficiency and using the diagnostic tests when you see such patients is the first thing I would like you to remember and the second is if you find iron deficiency we can treat it and intravenous iron might be a good option for that. Professor Anker, thank you very much for this excellent interview. Thanks so much. Pleasure.